Having our feet on the rock, what a blessing that that is to know that we have a solid foundation beneath us because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Just welcome everybody here this morning. Those of you joining us online, it's great to have all of your smiling faces and tentative ears wanting to hear what the Word of God has to say. Heavenly Father, we just lift up our voices to you. We lift them up to you in praise and worship and thanksgiving, Lord. Because you are a God who is present among us. You are a God who cares enough that you sent your son to die for us on the cross. We just thank you and praise you in his holy and precious name as we lift our voices once again to you in worship. We have birthday blessings for Blanche today on her 89th birthday. The rest of the family's out celebrating with her. Uh, prayers for a safe, safe harvest. Nancy's thankful that her kids in Florida are okay. Deb's asking for safe travel prayers for her family as they come and go to the funeral. De or Tabitha's dad has good days and bad days. Mom needs strength and peace to care for them, care for him. Tabitha needs prayers for understanding and peace as she steps up and helps out more with her dad. Healing for Todd's knee. Comfort for Deb and her family during this grieving time. And here's a little verb. Check out Bible BibleGateway.com. Todd posted some affirmations back there, a little short verse for every day of the week. Just say that many, many times a day. It's very helpful. Thank you, Chris. There's just so much going on in our lives these days. It's, it's hard to keep up with it. It's, it's hard to know where we are at. Sorry about this. There we go. Get all my text messages coming through. Um, but our Lord is so with us and there to carry us through when we don't need him and, and always has his ear turned to us to hear what we need. Uh, not just necessarily what we want or need in life, but that affirmation and that reassurance that we need. And it's just such a blessing to have a God and a Savior who are here and present with us, ready to carry us when we can't go forward on our own. And ready to help us out as we need that help. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, Lord. There are days when we feel we can't go on, and yet you're there to hold us, to carry us, and to lead us through those rough times, Lord. We just thank you for your presence in our lives, Lord. We thank you for the blessings that Carl has been in our lives these years, Lord. And, for the, and we just ask you to continue to bring peace and, and joy to the family. I know this is not a joyful time, but that memory, the joy of memory and remembering what Carl did for each of us and how we push forward each day, Lord. And we just want to thank you for that and, and just continue to stay with the call and and the Groves families, Lord, and, and all the families that are involved here, Lord. Keep them safe as they travel here and back to Central Illinois and, and travel home as well, Lord. Um, we lift up Tabitha and her family, Lord, as they're going through a struggle uh, just for peace and patience and strength and courage to get through all of this, Lord. We just lift that all up to you and in Jesus' precious name, Lord, as well. We just thank you, Lord, that you did protect Florida. We know there's lost life and lost property, but there is hope to be found in you, Lord. And we just pray that those people down there turn to you for guidance through this, Lord, and are able to understand and come to that full recovery with you by their side, knowing that you are there carrying them through the rebuilding and renewing process that they're going to go through. We just, we just lift them up to you, Lord. We lift our nation up to you, Lord, that 
has stood up and, and done what it could to help them, Lord, and continues to do, Lord, uh, each day. And we just pray that our nation will also come to you for guidance and understanding that we cannot be that great nation you intend us to be without your presence in it, without our faith and our obedience to your word, Lord. So we pray that everyone from the newest member of our country to our oldest and all of our leaders, Lord, seek your guidance and your presence in their lives, Lord, and then we can become that Christian nation you intended us to be, to be that Christian nation we once were. Lord, to just lift up you and lift up your word, Lord. We just ask for your protection over that and each and every believer here. Lord, and Lord, we're asking for protection. Keep our, our military and our first responders safe. Each day they put their lives in the lines and their families sacrifice so much to them. Keep them strong, keep them safe. Lord, we ask all of these prayers, we offer all of these prayers. And our thanksgiving to you through our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Isn't it great to know that we can stand in his power? That he is so close to us that we can just absorb the Spirit from him and know that everything in our lives is possible to get through. It makes me wonder why, what happened to the seven churches that we're studying right now happened. Why we're in the situation we're in today as a, as a nation and a world not standing in Christ and just I mean, and I, I've been there myself, I just, and I get it, and, but now that I'm here with him, and I, I'm in, in my own salvation, and my commitment to him, I just, I can't understand why people don't want to be here where we're at. But it is what it is. So we study today, we study where things went awry, we try and fix them to learn from our own history. And last week, this is, you, know, you may remember this slide, it's the same slide I started with last week. We talked about compromise being a dishonorable or, or saying shameful confession of something that isn't right in God's eyes. And then toleration, or tolerate is to allow the existence of something to happen uh, without hindrance without prohibiting it, without condemnation of that sinful behavior, that unrighteousness that happens in the world. And, and uh, you know, Smyrna, or excuse me, Pergamum was a, a, a compromising church where they would let things happen, or they wouldn't, it wasn't they let things happen, they began to do things in order to appease others. They would participate in ceremonies and, and of, of praise and worship to other gods. And this week, we move on to Thyatira. Thy 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 I always want to put an R in there and say Thyatira. It's Thy Thyatira. And um, you know, gardens, beautiful things. But as Chris will attest to, take so much work to stay beautiful like this. I mean, I, I every week for the last five years, she would come in and talk about how many hours she spent out in the garden pulling weeds and replanting this and moving that. And, 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 and <laughs> Dave as well. She would get Dave, you know, having Dave do the, the heavy lifting for her when she needed it. And all that work. But when you stop doing that, a garden can quickly get out of hand. 
you know, you, you walk out, and you're, you're running out of the house, and you look down, and, and you see a dandelion growing in the middle of your daisies, or your irises, or whatever, and you go, oh, I don't have time to get that right now, I'll get it when I come back. And you come home, you walk in, you don't see it, you forget about it. Three days later, now there's six dandelions, and some other things you don't want in there. It's like, oh man, I don't have time, I gotta get it now. Next thing you know, this is what you have. This one's for your penny with the garden gnome. I saw that and I had to put it in there. But if you look at that garden gnome, he's sitting there going, oh my God, what happened to my garden? <laughs> and he's just, you know, but that's what happens. But like weeds, sin, sin is, is the weed of the Christian life. And like those weeds, if we leave them unchecked, they will grow and destroy the kingdom, the garden of the kingdom, which is, we are the, the plants and the flowers and, and the light of that kingdom, the life of that kingdom. And those weeds will overcome it and block out those flowers, keep us from seeing the beautiful garden And all we see is the, the ugliness, the dirtiness, the, the, the unbeauty, for lack of a better term. And so I ask you these questions. Well, first of all, you know, do you have weeds in your life? Be honest, think about it. A weed is anything that you love more than Jesus Christ. Anything you are willing to put ahead of Jesus. Uh, your house, your family. Remember what Jesus said, love first God with everything you've got and then your neighbor. So we turn in uh, Revelation chapter 2 again, last half of chapter 2, in verse 18. Uh, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along in your Bibles, great. If not, I'll have it on the screen. For those of you joining us online, if you need a Bible, let us know. We'll get one sent out to you uh, in, in no time at all. But we read from Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 18, reading through verse 26. Jesus said this to John, To the angel of the church at Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are blazing fire and whose feet are are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and your perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immortality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, have and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my, does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one, that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star, 
Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's Revelations 2, 18 through 29. So Thyatira. Thyatira, you see it up here on the, on the map, just southeast of Pergamum, um, northwest or northeast of uh, Smyrna. It's the smallest of the cities that John wrote to, uh, but famous for its purple dye. And we know this from the book of Acts because that's where Lydia was from. Or, yeah, yeah Lydia who uh, Paul spoke with. And, and, uh, but one of the things about Thyatira is that it had many, like Pergamum, many trade bills or unions, if you will, and these were the weeds of the church. Um, weeds because each one had its own patron deity that they worshipped. Um, and with that, of course, came the festivals and seasonal activities and parties. And uh, most of that in, the, in that time also included a great deal of sexual revelry and adultery and immorality. Um, you know, sometimes we hear stories about work parties that got out of hand and things like that happened. Um, but think of it as just kind of a, a drunken free-for-all where people lost control of their own selves and Give in to their fleshly beings. And the church became tolerant of this. And, you know, and Jesus recognized their good stuff. Um, you know, they were progressing. They were moving forward. They, they, had, they were doing good work. They, had, they loved Jesus. They loved God. They loved the word. Their faith was strong. And they served the kingdom by serving each other and serving their community. And they persevered in the midst of all of this persecution that was also going on around them. Just like in Pergamum, if you didn't participate in the union or you weren't a member of the trade guild and you were making those materials, you were persecuted by the other members, accused of doing different things. Excuse me. And so they had to persevere through that. And they did for the most part. But then when you get to the end of verse 19, you really begin, begin to wonder, why is this church included in this list of churches that have are being reprimanded? And you know, most of these things, strong faith, spreading the word, taking care of your community, those are things that we would want in any church that we belong to. And then verse 20, we come to the problem. And we discover a prime example of what Jesus meant in the parable of the sower. And in Matthew, he told a story about a man who sowed seed and he threw some on the road, some on the side of the road, some in good soil, some in bad soil, and then, you know, how those seeds grew or didn't grow throughout that whole time. It seems I'm losing my mic, so I'm going to take it off and speak up. So he's talking about how the seed grew or didn't grow, depending on how that soil was. And, and in here, in Revelations, he's talking about Jezebel, that woman who called herself a prophetess. And she was sowing seed, sowing bad seed amongst the good seed as well. And... He, he used that, you know, to say, hey, you're letting, you're, you're letting your soil become bad soil. It's getting filled with rocks and not getting turned over appropriately and, and fertilized the right way. And, and uh, that's what requires that seed to grow, that good soil, that continuous 
hoeing in the soil, pulling the weeds, fertilizing it when it needs it. And he, and like I said, he mentions this Jezebel. And instantly, anybody who's been in the church for a while, when you hear the name Jezebel, your mind jumps to the Old Testament queen of Ahab and how she came out and, and killed all of the prophets of God, or had Ahab killed all of them, and you know, was calling herself a prophet and doing all these things against God and got Ahab to falter in his faith, and then, of course, Israel followed and faltered in their faith. And so whoever this, this woman may be, whether it was a real woman that Jesus is referring to within the church of, of Thyatira, or he's using this as an, an allusion to Jezebel of the Old Testament, um, this was a very influential situation that was going on. And somebody was able to convince the people to follow without question. So very charismatic, very well-spoken, um, you know, and, and so they follow without question. The other thing that could have been going on is this is just a metaphor, a metaphor for their own behavior as members of these guilds. You know, being a member of a guild and you just, well, all right, I'm not gonna go to that festival, but I'm also not going to say anything against the debauchery and the alcohol abuse and the, the sexual immorality and all of that that's going on. I'm just not going to go and I'm going to I'm going to close my eyes and I'm not going to you know the, the three monkeys see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. That's what I'm going to do. They can be them. I'm going to be me, and I'm just going to let it be. They tolerated this. They tolerated these things going on. And it led them, like in Ephesus, to ignore their own faults amongst each other. It's that, you know, today, today we call it you be you. Which in and of itself is not bad. But if you be you outside of Christ, that's when we run into the problems. If I'm me, and I'm not being obedient to the word, I'm not being a Christian. I'm not being, I'm not being me as God designed me to be. So we've come to this question of how do we love and tolerate? You really can't. But you have to love somebody and present them in a, present to them in a loving way how their lifestyle is falling apart. How it is wrong. How it is presenting a bad example to the rest of society. To their children. To their grandchildren. Uh, and that brings us to the second thing in verse 20. A failure to repent. Repentance. When we repent, that is physically pulling up the weeds in our own garden. That's recognizing the weeds that are growing in and around our garden. No matter how much pleasure they may bring us. You know, I have I I have a friend who is an herbologist. Um, you know, and herbs, most herbs are considered weeds in a flower garden. Um, herbs can be very beautiful. Uh, a, a blooming uh, basil plant is, is a beautiful plant. Uh, chives, you know, you get those big purple balls on the end of them when they bloom. That's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, botany, we, there's a, a, a saying that the only weed is the plant that's unwanted. So, Lucretia and I were driving in this morning recognizing the change of leaves and, and she mentioned that a, a field of corn was ready to be cut and we came across across the road and there was a field of beans there that are dried out. And I was like, yeah, those beans are ready to be cut too. And I took a closer look at it and there's like eight or ten stalks, green stalks of corn growing in the middle of this bean field. 
Well, corn, we want corn, right? Not our beans, we don't. So that corn is, you know, we call it rogue corn. But that's a weed in that field. Now, next year, when we flip flops and the corn field's the bean field and the bean field's the corn field, there won't be, but repentance is going through and pulling those weeds out, recognizing that it's something we don't want in our lives. Uh, you know, maybe it's the language we're using. You know, so we stop saying words like hell and oh damn and other phrases that we commonly use when we get angry. Um, you know, and, or it's, you know, instead of going to the, going to happy hour after work, with the, the guys from work or going to watch the game at the bar on Monday night, instead of having, you know, a six pack of beer, you drink a six pack of Coke. And, you know, you're gonna catch a, a, a rash of, of hot, uh, ribbing about it, but you can look at it and say, hey, I just, I don't need the alcohol to have fun. Um, you know, that's what repentance is. It's taking those things, pulling those weeds out and confessing to God, God, I have this weed in my life. I'm pulling it out. I'm throwing it in the burn pile and I'm lighting it on fire, giving it to you, essentially. You know, that's one way to think of that, but putting it in the burn pile is thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah. What if it got into Sodom and Gomorrah? He rained down fire and sulfur on them, burned the cities to the ground. That's I mean, repentance, burning, getting rid of our sins. Um, Jezebel did not do this. She did not repent of her sins. She had opportunity to. Even the original Jezebel back in the Old Testament, excuse me, prophet Elisha went and hid out of fear of her. And, you know, and she, she had her opportunities, and she didn't. You know, she, obviously, if this Jezebel here is a real person, God's given her opportunities. He's given us opportunity after opportunity. He gave that church opportunities. But they weren't seeing, they weren't standing for his word. They weren't standing on that rock that we sang about this morning and saying, no, I've got to have this strong foundation. If I let this weed grow on this rock, it will split it. And it won't be as strong. In the church, in my lifetime, 54 years, has I have seen a very tolerant church. A, to a tr tolerant church that, in all honesty, even with our newfound Freedom to preach in the public square. Our newfound abilities, you know, when the, the Supreme Court struck down or they came out and they said, no, we didn't mean you couldn't take your Bible to school. You just can't preach at school. Or they told teachers, you can't, you can't address this child about Christianity. But if they ask you, then you can open up about it. You know, when all of that came up, I still don't see us becoming less tolerant. I see us becoming more tolerant. And when I say us, I mean the global church, the big C church. We aren't standing on God's truth. We're tolerating things. And not speaking up like we used to. And I do, I've been asking 50, for the 54 years of my life. And granted, I don't remember the first seven of it, ten of it maybe, as far as that goes, with regard to this, but I've just seen this gradually happen more and more. Last week I mentioned the, the ABC show, show um, uh, the one with the cops that came out in the late 80s when we finally saw it, a naked male butt on TV for the first time. I don't remember the name of the show, which is probably a good thing, but you know, we just more and more, I can't turn a TV <coughs> on today, a regular <coughs> TV channel, and not be inundated with 
alcohol abuse, sexual immorality, adultery, lying, cheating, stealing, you know, and that's not even talking about the TV programs. That's just the news services. I can't watch a sports program without something being said. There's some, you know, we, uh, the, I'm going down a rabbit hole now. Um, you know, cheerleaders. Why do cheerleaders have to wear skirts that are only two inches below? Put them in sweatpants, put them in a shirt, they can still cheer. That's my point. Okay, I'm off of that horse. But you get my point. We tolerate so much in our lives and don't speak out about it. And if we're going to be disciples, think about that word, disciple, discipline. Almost the same word. The majority of the letters in them are the same. We have to have discipline, a responsibility to pull those weeds and to confront the sin and show people the beauty of the garden of the kingdom. Pull the weed away and say, this is what the sin is hiding. It's that exposure. We can't rationalize it away. We can't do, you know, like I, I said earlier, well, it doesn't bother me. I'm just not going to participate. You know, to not participate is to condone. It's that simple. You may not all outwardly do it, but it's saying, I'm just going to ignore it. No, no, it's not me. I'm not. I'm walking through life like this. Occasionally, I'm going to do this. Maybe this. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. But that's our responsibility as the church. Is to maintain our faith and to speak out on our faith. Our exposure is not to discourage, but to to encourage, to encourage towards something that is better, to a life that is easier, or can be easier, I wouldn't say it will be easier, can be easier. Can you imagine if all seven billion people right this second decided to say, I'm giving my life to Christ. Can you imagine how life, how easy life would become without the bickering and the quarreling and the fighting and the wars. But left alone, when we turn a blind eye, or we turn that key and lock our mouth shut, it's like not pulling a weed. One weed becomes ten, becomes a hundred, becomes a thousand, becomes a million. It festers and spreads until it seems impossible to overcome. Which is, I think, where we're at now. Standing like, like uh, Thyatira did, precarious church. And we're standing on the edge of a cliff right now. You know, and Chris, you've been down to Mexico, the, the big cliffs they have along the ocean that they dive off of. You know, those little tiny rocks that those guys stand on when they dive. You know, or the, the, the bluffs along Mississippi. Uh, the, the bluffs along Lake Michigan, these high, majestic, you know, straight down kind of things, we're standing on the edge of that. You know, as a kid, growing up along Lake Michigan, I used to go out there, and I'd stand like this, I'd get my 
my feet out on the edge. I need just my heels on that ground underneath me. Daring the ground to break away, basically. You know, and had it, the thing about that is, is you look at that cliff, you know, if you're like here, that cliff went like that, about six inches below where my feet were, went like this. So there was another six feet. I was, I was actually, you know, six feet out <laughs> over the edge of this, this straight down to the lake. Yeah, I didn't pay attention to how dangerous it was. I tolerated the opportunity, the, the uh, thrill, if you will, the thrill that it brought. You know, in my mind, I was beating gravity. But what happens when you stand on that cliff one too many times? Each step you take out there, underneath, a little bit of rock falls out. A little bit of rock falls out. Maybe you go out there. Maybe the next day somebody else goes out there. Maybe three or four people go out there at one time. One of these times, that cliff is going to give way. And you're not going to be able to balance on the edge of it. And down you're going to go. Suffering the consequences. <clears throat> Remember what Jesus said here. I will bring punishment on that Jezebel. I'm going to take her down. And her children with me. Or with her. Now I think about it. I think, I mean, if you're standing on that cliff. I'm standing out there as an 11 or 12 year old. And I had gone down. I had fallen. Probably would have killed me. My kids would have been taken with me. My two sons. Give you, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, that's a, a pretty big image to have in your mind. But that's what he's saying here is I'm going to take it, I'm going to take you, if you don't repent, if you don't stop tolerating all of these weeds in the kingdom, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to take out those who don't follow. Repent. And step back off of that edge. Step back onto that solid rock. Or don't come crashing down to the floor below. That he made those promises. I will keep you safe. Promises made to those who leave the garden. What are those promises? A privilege to reign. In the letter he says, one will reign. Um, which I think we, we can look at this many different ways. One way is to say that that one is Jesus Christ himself who reigns with an iron scepter. The word of God. But I think the other is that each one of us is given that iron scepter to reign within our group of 10, 15, 20 people that we are closest to. A privilege to reign with him in the millennial kingdom after the rapture and the tribulation. Not as a king of absolute power, but as a shepherd. Using that rod, that iron scepter, to both gather and protect, as well as discipline. That's what the shepherd's crook was there for. It wasn't there to beat the animal. It was there to, hey, boom, get back here. Or if I had to, reach out with that hook, wrap it around his neck, and pull him back in the other direction. It was a herding tool. A tool to make them focus where they needed to be. Each one of us is given that privilege to reign within the kingdom as children of God, as princes, if you will, of God.
to be that ruler, that protector, to provide discipleship to the sheep that are lost or trying to get lost. So along with the rod, we have the morning star. Scripture refers to Jesus, to the Messiah, as the morning star. If you've ever been privileged enough to be out at sunup, which I'm sure every one of us in here today has had that privilege at some point in our lives. You know, remember the old phrase, it's darkest right before the sun comes up? It seems that way, doesn't it? The birds stop singing for a little bit. The air kind of stops moving. And I mean, I've noticed these last couple of days driving back and forth from work that even the stars seem to be just a little bit dimmer right before the sun and the light crests over the horizon. And then that morning star comes up. In the middle of the darkness, the sun rises. In our case, it's not S-U-N, but S-O-N. The morning star rises. What did Jesus say we are? We are the light of the world. We are created in his image. Or he is the light of the world. We are created in his image. Therefore, we become the light of the world through our faith and our devotion to him and our obedience. And we need to be that light in the darkness. So not only do we have that scepter to protect those around us with, but we have a light to overcome the darkness that is in this world. And then in the, in the big scheme, the big picture of Revelation and the Messiah, the Savior, he becomes that morning star once again for us when he comes back to take us, to take his bride into heaven, to be at the millennial table, if you will, to be like him as true children of God and to experience everything that Revelation has to offer. The eternal life has. Last week I said that Pergamum was married to the world through its, its uh, compromising. Pergamum, or excuse me, Thyatira was teetering with progress. It kept moving forward, but it kept, it, it wasn't paying attention to what was going on, under, on underneath it. My previous illustration. But the other illustration I have for you about Thyatira, something we don't see very much anymore as a kid. They were deemed too dangerous for us. The teeter-totter. The teeter-totter. And when we sat on them, Hopefully this will work. You know, you, you tried to get on with somebody who was the same weight as you. Stay there. There we go. And it would just kind of go back and forth. You remember climbing on, you'd start, you'd start out on the ends, and then you'd come into the middle, and you'd see if the other person could still get it up or down, or you could get the closer you came in, because the further you get out of the way, the heavier it becomes. And you try and balance it at each point so that the teeter-totter can remain stable. But then there was always that one person who thought they'd be a smart aleck and they'd jump off. How many times did that happen? 
to you. With a teeter-totter, you'd go slam into the ground and that teeter-totter would bounce and you'd have to pick up that big one by 12, pick it up, move it back over the middle, get it centered over the fulcrum before you could get back on it. Or then there was my favorite thing to do. Was I'd be out on the end, or somebody would be out on the end like this. They'd be out there and I jump on it. wasn't supposed to go that way. It was supposed to go up and over the top. You know, and you'd end up going up over the end of it, over the handle that was on the teeter totter, and smashing your face into the teeter totter or into the ground. Remember those days? How much fun was that? We enjoyed those days, didn't we? But anyway, you know, the tragedy of the teeter totter, it has to be balanced. And so you have to you have to have that balance of love and discipline, I guess is what I'm saying in that teeter totter. We cannot tolerate sin. We have to pull those weeds out of our own gardens, out of the gardens of others, and we have to inspire them to pull their own weeds as well. So we have to we have to balance that that discipline and that love that we have in Christ to convince others of their need for that balance and to repent of their sins so that they don't, you know, get thrown off the teeter-totter or slammed into the ground on the teeter-totter or have the, the ground fall up below them while they're standing on the edge of the cliff. So I challenge each of us myself included, in this week, to look at our lives. What are the weeds that are in our lives? Some of us may have more than others. Paul and I are on that same page. I think Paul and I both have gardens of weeds, not gardens of flowers. But what are the weeds in your life? What is it that you have put before Jesus? And then pluck it. Root and all. Don't let any of it stick around. Repent before God. Pile them up. Burn them. And I could go on to another illustration about that, but we're already past our time. Pull the weeds and lovingly help others pull their weeds. Show them the real Jesus Christ, the loving, saving Jesus Christ, not the law, iron-fisted King Jesus Christ that the world thinks we worship. They think that because they don't know. They don't understand. They haven't been given the truth. So we need to, like Thyatira, be progressive. Progress from where we are now and provide that loving discipline that they need. For lack of a better term, we have to be lovingly intolerant about what's going on around us. We can't walk around with the monkeys or the horse pulling the carriage. Eyes wide open and mouth going. Don't let the rocks speak for us and speak for the rocks. But speak for Christ and show the world what our faith is all about. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for bringing us together again. I thank you for what your word has to tell us. How it warns us of where we're going or where we are. And it provides us with the solution to that problem, Lord. We just we lift ourselves up to you. We lift your word up to you, Lord. And we ask that you bring the two together. Help us to integrate your word into our life so that we can be those Christ-like children that you have called us to be. Show me 
how our image is just like you, in a loving, compassionate manner, filled with grace and forgiveness, Lord. While we help to pull weeds, not just our own, not just others' weeds, but our own weeds as well. So people can see the beauty of the kingdom and not the ugliness of man. Just thank you and praise you in your Son, our Savior's name. Amen. I hope you all had a great week this week. Enjoy the sunshine and the warm temperatures while we can. Cold is coming. Have a blessed week.